What's up, everyone? Joe here. In this episode, I got to chat with fellow podcaster, Air Force veteran, expert on entrepreneurship, and advocate for transitioning veterans, James Van Prien. During our discussion, we talked about developing win-win scenarios, the importance of building strong relationships, veteran support initiatives, and much, much more. Enjoy. Live. Learning. Leadership, the Llama Lounge. Yo, welcome back to the Llama Lounge, a dialogue on all things life, learning, and leadership. I'm Joe Bogdan. I have with me a friend of mine, James Van Pruyen, a fellow podcaster, Air Force veteran, expert on, expert on entrepreneurship, and a 100% amazing human being. What's going on, James? How are you? Uh, it's it's tough because I feel like five years into my transition, I've gotten better at being able to call people by their first name. But for whatever reason, since I know you're chief, it's hard not to just call you chief, but I'm doing pretty good, Joe. <laughs> yeah, please call me Joe. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. How, how's it going? So where are you right now? So I'm actually in Las Vegas area right now. I'm a split time between the Bay Area and Las Vegas lately. So Awesome. So how's our house things over there with uh, our current uh, like abnormal operations that we've been we're going through right now? Um, well, uh, in an interesting way, we might get into this later, but I do most of my, the stuff I do remote anyway. So it really doesn't matter mm-hmm. where I'm at. Um, I have a through Bunker Labs. We have an office in San Francisco. I work out of WeWork. So, you know, um, when I'm in San Francisco, most of the time I'm there a lot of days. And so now I just don't work out of that office. I work out of, uh, just basically the, the off, you know, kind of a, a home office type of a situation. So. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And we're definitely going to get into some of the amazing things that, um, that you do, James. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be connected, um, with James for our listeners, um, through uh, a mutual friend, Shay Sparks. And, um, and immediately we just, we just kicked it off and, um, we hit it off and started making connections for each other. And it's been just an awesome thing. And I was thinking, man, I need to have this guy on the podcast because there's so much goodness that can come from it. And, um, and, and, and your, your story and your experiences, I think, um, our listeners can get a lot from. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Oh, I love it. Thanks, Joe. I mean, I, you know, and just like me, when we can have other podcasters on the, on the podcast, it's, it's always a fun conversation anyway. Um, and I feel like there's so much that I've learned kind of through my transition so far. And, you know, I did 20 years in the Air Force, so I have a lot of, of context. And, and so I just, I love to, if I can help anybody in the audience, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And that's what it's about. So thanks, Joe. Awesome. Thank you. So, so whenever we have guests on, man, um, I always ask, and part of it's just be me being selfish. I want to know a little bit more about you. And I think that the, um, the listeners can get a lot of glean, a lot of wisdom from uh, various people's stories. And, you know, in the air force, we always talk about, uh, every airman has a story and I believe that's 100% true. And, and you're an airman through and through. So we'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself. And my big thing is how did James become the James of today? You know, <laughs> Yeah, and and we probably could take the next hour ish at least talking about that. But to kind of give some highlights, and on my podcast, I'd like to talk. You know, it's a military related podcast as well, related to business. You know, we all have interesting ways why I went in the military, and I think that's part of the story. Like I never thought I would go in the military, and it wasn't because I I didn't want. You know, I was a I was always pro military growing up. You know, loved Fourth of July, and you know. Uh, would see the army vehicles and near where I lived of the, like the army uh, reserve people there and her guard guys. And, and, but I just never thought of it for myself until my brother went in. So I have my older brother's about five and a half years older than me. And after high school, he had kind of done a few things and, and none of it really worked out. So he ended up going into the air force. And that was really the first time I'd even really thought about it at all. Like I had a cousin that was in for four years and, and the air force as well, but just didn't have a lot of people that were influencing me on that side, um, to go in the military. So, and I kind of talk about in an interesting way too. top gun when I was growing up was kind of one of the movies I really liked. And as I look back on it, it's interesting because it's really not a lot of overall military. It it is and it isn't, it shows you a glimpse of what the camaraderie is like and what the environments are like in certain cultures. Mm -hmm. 
but there wasn't a lot of her true military things in that movie. Right. It was enough to where I was just like, Oh, I could, I could go, you know, that's not seems cool. I could go do that for four years. Like, so I, he really only thought air force or Navy. And I was in a trade school at the time. And one of my instructors was a Navy or prior Navy. And he's like, well, for, for what we do in electronics, the Navy has better schools. You should go in the Navy. So then um, I was kind of like, well, I might go in the Navy. And my brother was like, well, my his brother-in-law was in the Navy. He's like, talk to him first. And I talked to him and he's like, go Air Force. So I was like, okay, if a Navy guy's telling me go Air Force and the recruiter's <laughs> like, you know, do you want to have a, be able to uh, have, enjoy your sports car, or your, your motorcycle uh, all year or only, you know, certain parts of the year that you're, that you're, you know, on land. So that was enough to kind of steer me toward the Air Force. But I thought even then four years and come back, like I was, uh, electrician or worked as as an electrician with my grandfather since age 10 i was in trade school for to be an electrician I, the thing that really appealed to me not only the job itself was also that i didn't have to go to school so in a weird way that's a lot of what has changed to me that's now is like i'm actually you know came out to the bay area to go to school that was the whole reason i came out but you know as you know as well you get in the air force and you know school is just so prevalent and so much of a cult, part of the culture, you know, and I remember in basic training, you know, they signed up for the GI bill, which was kind of pre nine 11 at the time. And I was like, well, I'm not really wanting to go to school necessarily, but like to pay $1,200 to get, I don't know what it was at the time, maybe 30, 40,000. It's like mm -hmm. the, the numbers make sense to me. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Just in <laughs> case. And uh, you know, and then of course, as you get in and you have uh, tuition assistance, which which went to 100 percent while early early on while I was in, and um, you know, before I knew it, I was clept most of my associate's degree, and uh, you know, been kind of on the long long journey to get finally get my bachelor's degree, and and now I'm on my master's program. So it's just, uh, and really, um, another thing I talk about in my career in the military, like what changed everything for me a lot in the Air Force is I was fortunate looking back to be assigned to a mobile or like a tactical mobile unit. So mm -hmm. my very first duty station was a uh, uh, Hill Air Force Base 729th Air Control Squadron. And so this was kind of pre 9-11. We start like our whole job was really to take our equipment, set it up in the middle of nowhere and then bring it back up and, and uh, you know, kind of set up communications. And we had a couple of radars, uh, vans and some operators that were, were in the vans talking to the pilots. And, you know, so we went, my very first, um, within probably eight months of being at my first duty station, we were already starting to go and do rotations in Kuwait for the no-fly zone to monitor the no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. And so I just, from a young age in the military, got used to learning how to deploy, setting up and deploying and being, you know, kind of working in that environment before we, well, I feel the Air Force got really busy after September 11th. So I kind of had a head start. Um, from a young age of being just kind of didn't know any different than that. So that really shaped my career. Looking back, I um, was in a combat comm squadron in Korea for a year. I was in uh, my last unit was joint communication support element. So we did, you know, a lot of deploying and, and supporting uh, some pretty interesting and cool customers, you know, in the special operations uh, side and stuff like that. So I got to kind of go out the same way I came in, in a way, like the last five years, it was, got to go to Afghanistan and um, some other cool things during that time. So went on several deployments in. So that really just shaped who I am, I think today, because of with, with that many years of being tactical, being in so many different teams, you know, and, and something I look back as I got toward the end of my career too, it was a little, I didn't like it as much at the very beginning. It felt like we just changed to change all the time. But what I, one of the skills I think that military specifically the air force for sure gets when we got out is look at how much we could adapt to really anything, you know, and, and you, right. and I didn't really realize as it was happening, how big of a thing that was because you just don't know that that's any different anywhere else. Right. So, um, so I think all those years, it, I didn't know I was going to do that many years, but it was, I loved the air force. I loved everything I got to do. And, you know, I, I always said, you know, I figured if I'm going to, go to 10, I'm going to go to 20 and, and, you know, kind of retire. And, uh, so I didn't really have any kind of aspirations really military wise after that, but I wanted to at least kind of get to that far. And, you know, I was kind of all in until it kind of was over. So, um, and if, and actually, you know, kind of for the record, if, 
if I had more years at the union I was at, I was, I got the, it was a four year control tour and I got to stay an extra year, but I would have had to go somewhere else. And I just was like, it just felt like a good ending point. It was at 20 years or just about it, just over 20 years at that point. So if I had more years at joint at JCSC, I would have probably stayed, but, um, and then kind of as I've transitioned, it's been like another sort of chapter that's probably, um, kind of added to who I am today, but definitely everything I've done in my life has changed directly because I went in the military and cause I went in the air force. That's awesome. So you kind of mentioned, and it's funny because uh, we have a little bit of commonality in our career because um, being a, a civil engineer troop, I'm actually an electrical power production by trade. So I've been assigned to actually two comm squadrons in my career. Um, and one of them was in combat comm at Robbins. And uh, so I got, I, so when you said, yeah, we get up and leave and go pack up in the middle of a field somewhere, I was like, yeah, I brought back memory, setting up the camo on the tents and, and, uh, setting up power with, the um, with the satcom dishes and all that stuff. So that, that was, that was a very fun time. Uh, but it was my first assignment. I don't think I appreciate it enough because I just thought, you know, you know, this sucks. So I got to put up camo on these things all the time and, um, keep on going out to the field and, uh, all that. But, uh, later on, I end up going to a fixed comm site, a DISA site in um, Japan in Camp Zama. And that was also very cool, but very different than the whole mobile type side of things. So um, I could see a lot of greatness and a lot of stuff that I learned from those experiences. Um, but you kind of mentioned how you were, um, you know, you're signed up for four and you ended up doing 20 and a lot of stuff happened in between. Was there ever like a, a, a legit where you think was like, a, this was the defining moment that I thought I'm committed all the way in or were you, and some absolutely. people you know, they say, okay, every four years they kind of move on. But can you describe that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, looking back, especially goes to my personality. I, I didn't, uh, there's a couple things. Cause when you go in the military, like you don't, I don't think, uh, I can I generally think a lot of times you don't really realize like, Hey, if I go this many years, it's this kind of retirement. Like I don't really fathom a lot of those things as I was first coming in. So you're, like I said, at the very beginning, especially it's like, okay, you know, first few years, Oh, I love where I'm from. I didn't, I didn't go in for any of the reasons that a lot of people did. And I remember like, I didn't care at the time of traveling. I didn't care about school. I was just kind of wanting to hang out and like, you know, those seeing those scenes and talk to go back to Top Gun, you know, just the fun parts of it, right? The camaraderie, like that did happen. And I saw that that was kind of what I was going for. So, but I always was like, Oh, you know, even those first few years, I'll, you know, I'm going to do my time and go back to Michigan where I'm from and, you know, kind of do my thing there. And I really kept going back and doing a lot of my leave back in back home. Um, but the first enlistment was so fast and, and so much of, of getting to deploy. And, and the other cool thing to go back to what you said of a unit, like a combat comm or air control squadron is unique compared to other units, I think, in the Air Force, because we, at least at the time, we deployed, you know, this was kind of prior to um, the AEF rotations, like just before it. So we would go as a unit. So each air control squadron was taking over for the other air control squadron in, in uh, Kuwait. And even in Korea, if we ever had to go to Korea, we yeah. would have like all augmented each other, right? And, or or yeah. work together. So I think, you know, those first few years, I'd already had a couple of deployments uh, we were doing. We were also supporting counter drug missions at that point where I got to go to South America. So, and as a unit, like almost all your friends went with it. Like it was all the guys that we deployed with back home and did those exercises. Now we're in a deployed location. So it was a like, I didn't want to stay there in my mind as many years as I ended up staying there at the time. But the unit itself, I loved the job. I loved what we got to do as, you know, together. And it just went so fast that I was like, hey, you know, and, and my first daughter was born and I hadn't really used much of my school benefit, which is kind of, you know, ironic to look back yeah. to where I just felt like, hey, I've got all these benefits and, you know, I should at least get my associate's degree since it's so available and, you know, got this 100% tuition assistance. And it's just, you know, you start to get you know, a little bit of uh, money, you know, compared to what you did at the beginning. And, and I was just like, this is uh this is a lot of fun. I want to do this just at least one more enlistment. So I think a long way of answering your question is that that was the biggest decision point probably was just that first Well, not, I mean, that, that one didn't seem like much of a decision. I was like, okay, quickly. It's like, okay, I'm going to do one more. But as I got more towards 10 and it's my personality, I was like, if I go to 10, I'm going to go to 20. So the hardest one for me was more between, you know, getting past that point where, okay, I'm re-enlisting for that next time that'll take me, you know, eight to 12 years kind of a thing. 
So that was once I knew that changed actually probably everything for me because of my personality. And you kind of get a little bit farther along in your career to where you're like, okay, if I'm showing up to work, if I'm doing this, I know I'm staying for 20 years, I'm in, I'm all in. So, and then another thing that my whole career, the, how I was always like, because I got so used to deploying and love to be able to do my job in the deployed location. Cause a lot of times on the comm side, a, uh, some places you don't really get to do as much unless you are deployed. So I became all along where I was like, okay, I'll go somewhere else. I want to go. I want to go. Um, so that was kind of all along. I, I was able to do so many different deployments and get to change. And I also liked how the air force has you change types of jobs you're doing and do a special duty. Cause I did a, my second duty assignment, one went to Keesler and did a special duty assignment. So I liked that. I was always getting to do different things and the deployed location is different. Every deployed location is different to an extent. So um, that was probably the biggest point where I knew, okay, I'm in for the long haul. Yeah. And you, man, you make so many good points in there. And the funny thing about the Top Gun thing is that's actually my favorite movie. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, I wanted to join the military too, not even knowing that that was, they were in the Navy, you know what I mean? When I was young, I had no idea yeah. that was all the same, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you brought up some good points there about how like, you know, the the military does a cool thing where you get to try different things. You may not even realize it. You might be in the, in the same work center, but you're doing different things. So um, we shift you over to learn some different things. And I, I, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people um, lately about how that's so important um, for you to may, remain inspired. Right. And how important is that, especially from like a leadership perspective, that you, you keep some type of inspiration yourself? I mean, our job is to inspire others. Right. As, as leaders. But but you got to also be inspired yourself. And I think part of that is is continuously growing. What do you think about that? I do. And I mean, it, it this is such a fun uh, the ability to have, be on your podcast and talk about these things. And again, very surreal in a way to to look almost like outer body to look back on those years and I just didn't I knew it but I didn't appreciate it in real time because I think also not just because of the way things are you're how we always were is like okay you're always ready for the next thing like even though you had leaders telling you and you know be present enjoy the moment take pictures and all the you know like capture all these things like everything was so good like I was like okay what's happening next what's happening next you know, you get back, what did we do? What what can we do better? Let's do it better and go to the next thing. And I don't know, you know, as I kind of think about my career, I was able to be, you know, in a joint environment, like early on, like I went to uh, Africa in 2006. And that was kind of my first mm-hmm. exposure to being joint at all. And it was really eye opening, because I was like, you know, our boss, my direct supervisor boss was uh, Army E8 just mm. hardcore, you know, in the air force, we're used to calling everybody <laughs> sir. And he's like, you call me, sir, one more time. You're going to do <laughs> pushups, you know, he's like, yeah. you know, you're going to be on your nose for the day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I got to do, you know, those, a few months, uh, you know, about six months joint in 06 in Africa. And then, you know, finishing my unit, my last five years in a joint comm unit, I got to do, uh, like, a um, joint plans, uh, course toward at the, my last year. Cause I was in plans for a very, uh, comp planning for the very last year of my career. So as I look back, I, you know, I did honor guard, um, you know, and that's kind of a cool story too, of how I've, you know, quote unquote fell into honor guard, but like th- I did three years on and off of honor guard in, in Colorado Springs. And it was great. You just, I've, you know, as I look back and even talking to people that transition, like I and even talking myself, it's like you you know it, but you don't realize afterwards mm-hmm. all the things that we're getting. And I thank the military space, but definitely the Air Force specifically because you I mean it's not it's by design, it's not a mistake. You know, you it's that whole quote unquote cliche of whole person concept, but it's truly like after doing twenty years of a of a career where you're kind of going you know all out, hundred miles an hour. You know, there's just so many experiences that I was able to get, you know, a year remote in Korea in a combat comm unit and air, air control squadron, yeah. you know, JCSC in a joint comm unit of a deploy or like airborne unit. So, yeah. So you, you were at the hump and, uh, and when you're in Korea at 607, I was 607 combat comm in 2004. Yeah. Oh, nice. You know, we were there at the same time. I was over at Osan then. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And actually the job I was doing there was like a comsec custodian slash security manager. Okay. So, I would actually okay. go to Osan almost every week to get 
you know, to get our material and stuff that we kind of fell underneath Osan for, for reporting and stuff. So, yeah. So my buddy, Abby Scott was there with you that same yes, time. Oh, I know him. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I know. yeah. So yeah, he's, he's an amazing dude. He's over in Hickam right now. I actually had him on the podcast not too long ago. That's, oh, that's awesome. Soon, and it's but... a small world. And I remember, so I was in, at Shriver Air Force Base. And I forget when I was there because I don't think I was stationed there. I think I was just visiting. And I don't remember if I was already out or not yet, but yeah. I actually saw a picture of him, of, of his, like, I don't I think he was like NCO of the year or NCO of the quarter, okay. some sort of award like that where he was, his picture yeah. was on the wall. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, he actually wrote a really cool article on uh, my llama page about uh followership. It's called leadership is overrated and everybody, it, it, it took off pretty well. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Small world for sure. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I also, you know, funny thing about Camp Humphreys is for number one, I didn't want to go to Korea. I knew that was probably, Cause I volunteered for it to get out of my first assignment, you know, cause I wanted to go somewhere else and I didn't get it. And then when I got to my, you know, to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, I liked it there. And then I got non-ball to Korea. But when I went there, it was cool. Because it was a great year. It was a great unit. We had a great commander, great leadership, but it was, it was kind of the best of both worlds. Cause we could do what we were close enough to Osan to not have to play air force stuff mm-hmm. and do our kind of exercises and an army installation where we didn't have to do the army stuff either. So yeah. it was kind of like we had, yeah. we, we were really pretty fortunate to be at, at the hump. So. Yeah. So Abi gets to do that two assignments in a row because he was there with you. And then he went with me to Camp Zama in Japan, where same thing, we're on the army, army post. They don't even know why we're there. <laughs> so and the Air Force kind of leaves us alone too. So we just played a lot of intramural sports, but it was good. It was great times. Great learning. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so that's awesome, man. So like, thank you for sharing your story. Um, Because I think that there's a lot in there that because you, you kind of talked about it, like you you didn't even want to go to Korea, right? You're non-vol there, which I was also non-vol there on my second term. And, and great things happen from that. You know, it's not something I necessarily look forward to. And how, you know, remaining present in the moment, how, how important that is. I, I think that, you know, a lot of times, we're learning on the periphery and we don't even realize it. And that is so important. And if we can kind of identify it, I don't, I think it can kind of take us to the next level because sometimes like, Oh, afterwards you look back, you're like, Oh, I kind of learned all that stuff during that. But I I often wonder like, what if I was actually aware at that moment, you know, how much better could I be? Right. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's so, so interesting as you think about these things, because I think I feel there's, there's, there's goods and bads to this. I think the bad thing is like, I don't, you don't realize how well trained and how well you prepared you are for things. Like even now, I, I think there's just, and what I'm meaning by that, not and that it's truly bad, but it's like, you have a responsibility when you feel that as you get older and more you know established in life, you're like, I'm obligated. I mean, at least I feel it. I'm obligated. I'm like, look at all the way I was trained. Look at all these experiences. Like, I, that drives me. And, and as I have conversations with people, you just have so much perspective because you've been given the ability, you know, do a lot of it through the military. And then, you know, kind of things I've done post-military that, that were set up by me being in the military. So it's, it's interesting. It's definitely, you know, I, th- I think again, a lot of times, maybe not everyone, but I think a lot of people at those young ages, you know, I went in 18 and stayed till 38, like, I just didn't know what I was getting. Like you, you, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you sense it a little bit, but you just don't truly appreciate it. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's that ride. It goes so fast and it's sober. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Just, then I always liken this. And one time it actually frustrated me cause I was talking to my young NCO uh, that I put him into like an admin position and he was a structures guy. You know what I mean? He's like, no, I want to go out there and build stuff. But I was like, no, this is going to be good for you. You're going to kind of be like a program manager and learn all this stuff. And I told him, I was like, it's like paint the fence, man. He was like, huh? And I was like, paint the fence, you know, wax on, wax off. Mr. Miyagi. And he was like, what? I was like, you never seen Karate Kid? He was like, no, I seen the one with Jaden Smith. I was like, oh, okay, get out of my office, man. <laughs> get out of my office. But, you know, he was too young to remember the original Karate Kid. But when you think about it, like there's so many opportunities that we do things and we learn so much more, you know, and we're not even tracking it. When I was at Camp Zama, um, my job was actually pretty simple. It was very important, but it, it wasn't very time consuming. So I became the v- the vehicle control officer, the security manager, the, you know, the, the uh, GPC card holder to make purchases. And I learned every program you could possibly do 
And no, no way did I think it was just me trying to keep busy. I get to my next installation. I become the non-commissioned officer in charge of the work center and knowing all those things and managing. I mean, that translated into success later on. So, um, so many things. And, and you, like we kind of we will probably talk about a little bit more, too, is how does that translate into your next career moving on? Right. Um, I've learned that there's some there's a lack of a lot of developmental programs in the civilian world when you transition over and you're like, Oh, you're supposed to know this now, right? So, and I'm sure you're, you've experienced or talked to a lot of people about that too. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, again, I think as I'm even, you know, hearing you talk about it now and knowing, I think that's probably overall one of the biggest things that is lacking a little bit and is needed on um, both the civilian and the military side is the, a lot of military, I think, don't truly ever, it takes them probably quite a while when they get out. And I don't, you know, I don't want to generalize, but it's somewhat of a general thing of like, cause we have so many skills, the, the military, I'm sorry, the civilian side, a lot of time doesn't understand truly. And it's kind of a lot of our role and responsibility coming out and, and people that are helping in that side, transitioning out to be able to better articulate it. And I think, I think we're getting better. I think over time, like it's just getting better and better and better. But I think a lot of times, you know, even now I'm thinking, you know, I've kind of gone the business route, but like you, you don't even like just talking, I'm remembering, you know, with this conversation, a lot of the things I've done, it's like, oh yeah, I do know how to do that. Oh yeah. I remember, you know, because <laughs> like you said, you do so many things for so long. It's just, of course, who wouldn't do all these things? You don't right. know that that's not normal. And, and I think, you know, we coming out a lot of times with so much experience in so many places in the military space that, you know, that's just something I think that, that unfortunately doesn't get as, as well done coming out to, to explain that. It's obviously our role to, to be able to explain that to the people that, you know, in the places that we're going, but, you know, some probably better than places than others, but I think that's, that's something as I, you know, we're talking about this, I think we, you know, military people right now, the better, the quicker and the better that you can really capture that for yourself and, you know, I think there's tools now that help you better, right? LinkedIn wasn't really much of a thing when I was in, but, um, right. you know, things like that, I think help and people getting kind of out there and putting what they're doing and all the different skills and, and stuff like that maybe helps too. So, Yeah. And I think um, one of the big things is we kind of transition um, to something that I think was just a cool topic to talk about. And you brought up LinkedIn and everything else and how we got connected is, is building strong relationships, right? And it's so interesting. And I, I usually try to, I think networking is a cool word, but unfortunately what I think is sometimes people kind of think of networking as a quid pro quo, like, you know what I mean? Like more like that, but I'm think I like to use the word building relationships more because I think there's so many opportunities to advance everybody, create win-win scenarios uh, and, and just actually just be happier in life because you have great relationships with people that uh, like you and I being able to connect. Um, I, I, I feel happier just getting to know you, man. And I, I really mean that. And so, so what do you think about how the importance of, you know, build, being able to communicate and build strong relationships, you know, in, in, in translating to whether it's transitioning from one job to another or one career to, you know, going to your next chapter in your life, um, just, just building connections, building relationships and, and learning your learning to improve your social skills. I mean, those are things I think are so vital. Yeah. And Joe, uh, that's, I love this question and, and I want to hit on a few things that, that I was already kind of thinking about. And I love how you talk about it. We do it in the military from the very beginning to the time you're done is, and it's, it is networking, but we don't really think of it or talk of it as much on the military side as networking. It's that relationship building. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. Why wouldn't you do it? And you're not like, Hey, every entity on base, I need these things. I mean, you do if you do, but like you do it, you get those relationships before you need it both ways because you know, Hey, we need to do this or we could do this together. That creates that win-win that you talk about. So in the military, all those years in the, in the military space, you know, when I go on deployments and then more and more, I know more people at different bases. I know more people in a supply you know, job or these different areas. And then as you get kind of more rank and you become, you know, go to some certain schools together, that's, that's the added thing that's good about those, those schools and those experiences is you're adding those relationships, i.e. networking so we, so as I got out, like what was interesting was, okay, I've built all these relationships on the military side and 
you know, and, and uh, oh, by the way, later, you know, those those relationships will be there, you know, as we talked about some people that I know that, you know, that were that I served with. And I know people after I got out that I served with, like, th- you'll still know those people. So then now as our jobs change and our lives change, you will have those relationships but from the past. And you just never know, you know, when that that will come and you'll need that as a win win. You know, as as you know, you and I got introduced by a, a friend, you know, someone that, you know, and that's someone that I had met recently is really probably the only way that we know each other. But everything that comes out of that was as we build this relationship is that win win. And so really, as I was coming out of the military, I personally a year before I got I was like, OK, I love Tampa, Florida, where I was at. I was like, OK, I want to stay here in the local area. I know I don't want to go get a job somewhere. I want to be in the business space. But I knew no one overall in the military. I'm sorry, in Tampa, Florida, like Mm -hmm. overall, right. We were just gone so much and you kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, in the military, a lot of times you just hang out at the base and then you go home and maybe, you know, a few of your neighbors and that's about it. And so uh, I was, I kind of learned a lot of quote unquote networking skills or more building on this skill I'd already learned and just not really used. I kind of, personally pivoted where I was like, okay, I know all these people. If I wanted to get an IT job, I know a lot of people that I could uh, talk to either on the military side or the prior military people that are in the civilian jobs. I could probably do that, but I wanted to do something in the business space. So I was like, okay, I know no one. So what do I, so I just personally was like, okay, I got to start somewhere. Like, okay, let me go out in the local community and meet as many people in the business space as I can. Mm-hmm. that was the beginning of what has changed my life. Like if I would not be talking to you right now on a podcast and having my own podcast, if it wasn't for that day of, of saying that, because I was fortunate to find exactly what I was looking for at the very beginning of that transition is uh, I went and f- I, um, found a e-marketing meetup group in the local area that was actually um, kind of a, uh, a way into this business organization in Tampa called Tampa Bay Business Owners Organization. And the founder of that, both the e-marketing group and TBBO, as it was called, is a guy named Chris Kermitsos, who, as I was getting out, they were just getting into podcasting. Second, a second. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's all good. <laughs> and and so just as I was getting into podcast, or, or just as I was meeting them, they were getting into podcasting. And he started a podcast conference at the beginning of 2015 that I was able to not you know help out, learn these things. But at the same time, like at his events, I was learning. Like he's very good at connecting people together. Uh, at these smaller uh, events that we were having, I was volunteering and helping, but. I was uh, kind of standing up and telling people about myself at the e-marketing groups. So I was now, as I look back, getting practice, being, you know, doing these things a little bit different, like, you know, and it's just a little bit different for me anyway. It was on the military side versus on the civilian side. So when I was coming out, I was trying to, okay, I want to reinvent myself as something else. Like I want to go away from what I did in the military. I don't want to do IT you know, at the time I was still in, so obviously it was, you know, I had a military haircut and I was still, you know, it's gone some, I was, the, you know, still in plans and, and overseas a little bit doing, doing some things at the very end. But as I got out, a lot of the people I know now and the relationship, uh, um, the relationships I have now came from that, doing that, you know, kind of getting involved in that business organization. Chris is, was sort of to me a mentor of mine, but is someone that I now am actively involved in doing things with and, you know, I've uh, helped him out on his uh, with his conference at you know, doing a booth for for Podfest at different conferences with him, and hmm. I've, I've, I've met a lot of people kind of through those relationships in the podcast space, and really that's probably in a way how I met Shay as well. So, yeah, and that's really cool because um, I know I've talked to a couple people about this recently, um, and whenever this topic of transitioning has been has come up, and it's come up recently quite a bit actually, but. Uh, one of the things that um, has often comes up is that us as military personnel, we learn that we have to build communication, uh, a network, uh, build relationships, learn how to communicate effectively. And it doesn't matter what rank you are when you end up transitioning. 
a lot of us end up sh- like clamming up at that point. And we're like, okay, now we're going to figure something out instead of leveraging the fact that we already knew how. Now we stop communicating and, you know, and we're not u- use- utilizing and effectively communicating and it starts to uh, downward spiral in a lot of ways. And I think, um, you know, your story is pretty cool because you kind of just jumped out there and started figuring it out even before you start transitioning, which I think is important. And I think that's what kind of some of the stuff that you're working on, um, you know, is helping that peripheral learning of teaching people how to kind of build those networks on the way out. I think that's vitally important. I think, like you said, we are getting better at it, but um, there's a lot of room for improvement still. And I think also um, a couple of things I thought of. So one of the things I had heard somewhere right as I was getting out that stuck with me and I don't remember who saying it is, but it, it's the whole build the bridge before you need it concept. And when I heard that, it just, you know, I, I, I'll never forget it. Like it just hit me. And that was what, because I've always done, you know, kind of maybe one of my personal strengths, I, you know, we didn't have the, the tools to do it as much early in my career, but I've always been a relational person anyway. I love, you know, had a lot of great experience with, my first, you know, the air control squadron and knowing a lot of different people, my best friend to this day, I met, you know, early on, like within the first six months of me being there, um, you know, know him really well still to this point. I, my first NCOIC, I stayed in touch with. So I already had all those years of as best I could staying in touch with people. So as I was getting out, like when I heard that build the bridge before you need it, I was like, you know what, with all the tools we have, you know, of course I was an, a communicator anyway in the military. And then now as I'm coming out, I got a you know smartphone at the time and technology has given me the ability to, you know, use tools I didn't use in the military. And actually, as I talk to a lot of people now, that's probably the one thing if I could tell myself then not knowing, you know, kind of if you knew then what you know now, what would you tell yourself? I would have told myself to better use those tools while I was in. Because it helps even while we're in, like when you're, the, you know, when you, I'll go to all these places, the quicker I can get a hold of someone as many different ways as possible, the better. So, you know, we didn't use Facebook Messenger very much at that point at a top secret clearance. So I really was hesitant really to use uh, social media a lot. But these right. tools, like every social media platform has a way to communicate with someone, you know, uh, text and all those kind of things. And LinkedIn, you know, I didn't use it all at that point. So as I was coming out, now I don't care as much about my top secret clearance because for me, I'm not going to go work at the base. Like I just totally opened myself up where, where I was really private before, you know, for, mm-hmm. I was really kind of old school OPSEC. I was like, okay, so as best I can, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing at any point. Unless, I mean, if you need to know, I'll let, you know, people who knew me well knew, but right. everybody else is like, right. I just don't need to kind of put all my stuff out there. But as I right. started to transition, I was like, okay, now I'm going this opposite direction. So every person I met, I felt was a potential, you just never know kind of a thing. And I was interested in talking to them and learning from them. And a lot of people want to help you and introduce you to people as you're coming out. So, you know, that kind of built that uh, experience of, okay, you know, build the bridge before you need it. You just never know, you know, I might talk to three people that are all, you know, somewhere else in education. Maybe that's not a space that I care about or, you know, their teachers mm-hmm. or in the school space. But I always like watch, you know, my mentor kind of be able to connect the right people together. I was like, okay, if I'm have the ability to kind of introduce all those people together, that kind of satisfied like this thing inside of me. So even though that's a skill and that's, you know, there, there's some strategies, strategy to that as much as that sounds bad, not to just to do it, to do it, but like to put the right pieces because you just never know who might later, like, you know, you've introduced me to three different people. What do you need? Here's somebody that would definitely be able to help you. Like it's, right. and we do that a little bit in the military, but as I've gotten out and done that more and more and more, that's, you know, it's just so cool to have people kind of working in the background. And that's actually how I'm talking to you right now and know you. So, Right. And I think that it really opened up my eyes uh, being still an active duty service member that um, I think in a way, and it sounds kind of corny, it opened up my eyes in an optimistic way that that there's people out there that really just want to connect with you to help you out. And I think that's, um, you know, I think that we kind of have a health, a healthy amount of skepticism, you know, when we're meeting people and you're wondering, okay, what do you want from me type of thing. But the more I talk to people like you and some of the folks I've been connected to, I'm like, well, wow, there, there's a lot of good in this world. There's a lot of great people and, and you are absolutely a connector, James. And I think that's, that's really cool. And you have a great skill with that. And, and, and I love the example you use kind of like, okay, you had a TS clearance, so you're kind of closed up. And then like, when you realize you didn't really need that TS clearance anymore, you're opening up, you know, the aperture and be able to connect to people. I actually feel like from what my experience talking to people transitioning was 
they were treating, they were actually living the opposite during their military career. They might've been a little bit more open. And then when they actually transitioned, they, they act like they got a TS clearance. And they don't talk to anybody anymore. And it's, it's very odd, like <laughs> contrast of how that happens. And I, I always like, whenever I hear something like that and I start looking at it, like, it makes me wonder, like, why is that happening? You know, why is that happening? And why do we have to, you know, um, go through a lesson on, hey, you know how to communicate, continue to do that. And I think some of the things that you and your team are doing with Bunker Labs and a lot of other things that I'd love to get into next is is helping people transition with skills that are actually, you know, uh, that are, are relatable, right? And it's not just, okay, hey, here, write a resume. Here, this is how you interview for a job. It's more like, these are connections you can make. These are mentorship, you know, connections that you may need to help you in your pursuit of your goals or whether you want to be an entrepreneur or whatever else it might be. Yeah. And, and there's so much, you know, it's interesting you say that because I guess I even learned from hearing you say that is, you know, a, as I look back for me, definitely I value the business organization I was able to be a part of because I was able to practice a year before I got out, a lot of these skills that I just got better after I got out of just doing more of that. But it, the switch for me was because I knew, okay, when it's over, it's over. Like I knew enough to know I'm going to, I'm, I'm into it. It's over. But once that's done, you know, we're, you know, thank you for your service and it's good. And it's a good base to be on, but like you're, you know, you have to figure out what's next. So, you know, it, I've kind of went from a big community in the military space that you're always going to have with, with, with active duty and uh, retirees and veterans. But then I became, you know, slowly got this new group of people and, you know, you started to, you know, I started to learn from people who are doing, you know, different backgrounds and different experiences on the outside. So it's interesting you say that as it definitely would encourage anyone to the quicker that they can do that. And, and for me, I just did it to me out of necessity. I was like, okay, Mm-hmm. I don't know anyone like I like I got to figure out something and I luckily fell into it and got practice and a lot of the, the skills I've developed I don't know that I had as much I might have had them but I didn't use them as much in the military because I didn't need to use that type of a skill the way I was using it but as I kind of fell in you know fell underneath a group of people that were kind of showing me the way maybe for for that transition you know and and even relationships I have now were developed you know, through people there introducing me to people that I do stuff with to this day. Um, so I definitely would encourage people that are listening, you know, that's a big thing, you know, definitely it's not the time to clam up or to, you know, to right. go in, uh, you know, go turtle or to go recluse, recluse, you know, definitely um, and put yourself out there. But yeah, like the, so many things that have happened after I got out have, have, you know, I kind of see the importance of these organizations. And I think a lot of times, you know, even what we've talked about, like, because of being so mission focused and having such a a belief that what you're doing is for a, a better good and a higher thing, you know, that has been with me ever since. And I think a lot of people I talk to, it feels like it's the same way. And as we transition and, and see different things that could be done better, it's kind of a thing that I never probably won't have. So that's why I love organizations like Bunker Labs that I'm a part of. And and these other resources that have become more and more prevalent. Um, Cause you know, of course it's, it's cool that, that there's so many people that say they support the military, but truly when you see more and more, you know, both um, on the civilian side and on the you know military side, like when they get these alliances and these programs, there's just so many things out there to help people at all different points, you know, in the, in, whether you're in the military or coming out of the military. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I think, and and we talk about win wins. I think there's so much, you know, there's so many win wins out there, and Bunker Labs is a big part of it. And I'd love for you, because a lot of our listeners probably have never even heard of Bunker Labs. They don't know what it is, um, you know. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to educate um, some of our listeners on what it is if they're transitioning, and even our civilian counterparts, they might find some um, some good value in here. So, could you can you kind of break down what what Bunker Labs is and how it kind of came to be? Absolutely. So. Interestingly enough for me, as I kind of talk about my transition, so I retired effectively March of 2015. I came back from, uh, I was comp planning. I was fortunate in my opinion to kind of go out still getting to work to the very end. I was uh, over in Italy for a exercise to help uh, U.S. Army Africa do their joint. They were doing an exercise, but we were coming there kind of as to help them on their joint plan side. 
And within, I think, two or three days of us being there, uh, the Ebola mission kind of dropped and, and mm. came really heavy. Okay, hey, we got to deploy all, so many assets down to the African continent to support the Ebola mission. So because of that and because I had been deployed so much, like when I, I didn't even get to stay as long as I would have stayed if I was still had more time left. So when I got back to Florida in October of 2014, like whether I wanted to or not, like that was the last day I ever worked because like, you know, I was okay. I got to get ready for my retirement. Like have all this user views leave. And so as I was um, doing those things, like I knew I wanted to get into business. I had been a part of that business uh, organization, learning kind of training, but I went through the TAPS class twice. They had a thing that was kind of boost the business. It was a couple of days mm-hmm. that a, a TAPS program at the time had a couple of day entrepreneurship track that they called it. Score came onto the, the, you know, to the base during that program and would give us, you know, uh, advice and, and kind of have a little bit of a opportunity to work with them and network. But at the time, as I look back, I felt there was not really a program like what Bunker Labs is right now. For the on the military side, for the military veteran or military spouse business, um, Bunker Labs was founded in about the time I was getting out. So in 2015, um, a guy named Todd Connor, a prior Navy officer, um, and and I may be getting a little bit of it wrong to know the very like how that was mm-hmm. formed at the very beginning, but mm-hmm. for the most part, he founded Bunker Labs. I forget what it was called at that point, but. Of course, in my at my time transitioning, there was no way I would have ever even known what that was, and so they obviously saw, you know, kind of goes back to what I said. They saw a need in that and out in the space, like, hey, we want kind of, as I say, a community, a flagpole, and these are my words, kind of to describe it, but like a place where we can all kind of come to have this common thing of being in different areas of of our of our whether we're transitioning, whether we're in business already, getting into business. It's this kind of overall community um, that that they were establishing. Um, and so it was founded out of Chicago. So I, I started my Veterans and Business podcast in 2017. And one of the people, one of the first few people I interviewed, his name is John Van Horn, had lived in Atlanta, but moved to Denver, I want to say late 2017. And so... I think I knew somebody else who talked about Bunker Labs before, so I'd heard the name, but he was the first person that really kind of put it more on my radar. And he's because I was going from, I think I was talking to him about coming out to California to go to school because I uh, started school at the beginning of 2018 in San Francisco. So I moved from Tampa to San Francisco. And as I was making that transition, John was like, hey, because John had moved to Denver and uh, one of the chapters for Bunker Labs is in Denver. And um, he told me, he's like, hey, this this program is also in San Francisco. They have this thing called the Veteran in Residence Program. So what the Veteran in Residence Program is just one of the things that Bunker Labs has. It's a six-month program, and Bunker Labs has partnered with a co-working space called WeWork. And a co-working space is basically mm-hmm. like an office where everybody kind of pays different amounts to have different sizes offices where they can kind of work out of there instead of work out of home or, or other places. So we work in Bunker Labs partnered and and have this program called the Veteran in Residence. So for six months, up to 10 military veteran or military spouse businesses can go through kind of almost like a they call it an incubator. It's kind of a group train or not group training isn't the right word for it, but it's like where people are at different stages of their business, but they collectively as a team help each other out. And the mm-hmm. Bunker Labs chapter there also facilitates and helps and plugs the right resources in and the right people for what the group needs and you know, kind of build on that. Um, and of course, uh, when I got into San Francisco, the other thing for me to go back to kind of talk about all these, end up kind of even tie up some of these things together. I had everything I'd learned in Tampa, kind of plugging into the local community, especially the business community. I was like, okay, I'm coming out. I know, I know I've never really lived in California and never been to San Francisco hardly. I'm very much new here. I want to plug in and really meet the different businesses and really do a lot of what I did in Tampa, try to do that in San Francisco. So I was already kind of looking for that. And a friend of mine had moved, had gotten out of the army as a, he was a Green Beret. And he went through and got accepted to the veteran residence program in San Francisco, 
right about halfway, you know, I'd been there maybe three or four months. And this was just after I'd heard of it from my friend, John. And I was like, and so he started inviting me to these bunker lab events because they have also something that's called bunker brews, which is uh, kind of like a networking event basically is, is the, the easiest way to kind of say it, but it's um, a chance to, we can bring in a speaker or bring in some kind of topic. Um, and we, it's a way to really bring the local community and the military and veteran and military spouse community all together at the same time. And obviously, you know, let them know as well what bunker labs is and, and kind of get the word out for this program, you know, for bunker labs or even the veteran residence program. So I started seeing what it was. I had a friend that was going through the program in San Francisco and then, you know, I remember because we were also going to the same school and, and one night we were we were having a drink and he's like, I would really love for you to, you know, be a part of this. Like I'm going to you know, take over as a city leader. So the the local chapters have and I forget the exact number right now, I should know better. But like there's at least I want to say 21 chapters, I believe, right now mm-hmm. across the U.S., um, in California, there's three, there's, uh, the one in San Francisco, there's one in Los Angeles, there's one in San Diego. And in the local level, we, they use what they call city leaders to run the program. So, um, I took over at the beginning of 2019 as a city leader for bunker labs. Hmm. Um, and I've kind of been involved ever since. Uh, so I, I definitely want to answer questions about what that is, but it really, is a community and, and here's another cool thing for me as i really have understood the relationships you talked about or networking is not only are we gaining ac- access to the people across the world that, that work out of we work for the bunker lab or for the veteran residence program all the people that have ever come before that have gone through the bunk- bunker labs world or you know kind of programs and and community past present and future so it's like you have this group of people that it'll just keep getting more you know uh, more people and more people and more people. So it's, that's kind of a lot of how I would describe it to people is it's just like this ecosystem of military veteran and military spouse entrepreneurship. Yeah. So in, in essence, it's kind of like, it was, it was like a grassroots movement, huh? To help veterans kind of transition and, and learn about business. And, um, and in a way it's become this thing where, like you said, the ecosystem or almost like a fraternity of of folks that are together and just mentorship and helping each other out. And, and is it like, is it very um, uh, selective on who can get into these programs like you mentioned, or is it something like they could just kind of get on the website and, you know, connect? Yeah. And that's a great question, Joe. It's, it's actually both. So the veteran in residence program Mm -hmm. basically is uh, rotating, right? So every six months ish, there's the application period. Mm-hmm. And once we take all those applications, which actually we just got done with this process like a couple of days ago and selected the next group of people that'll start in July. So that, and actually, you know, for the record, just to, to be clear to the, the it, we had, it was 10, we were taking 10 up to 10. Now it's eight just because of the, the stuff that's mm-hmm. happening right now with COVID. Um, but either way, like we take as many applications we have and we basically get the best group we can and sometimes there's some people that maybe are close, but it's just, you know, like, like anything is people kind of, uh, there's a, a three-step process of, of selection that we go through. Mm-hmm. Um, but once we, we select that group, then that group, you know, gets notified that they're a part. And, um, but then it's, you know, not only is it in San Francisco, but maybe it's in another city to where that person might apply in, in San Francisco, but then they maybe are in a different city later. And they didn't get accepted in that pro that part of the program yet. Maybe they get accepted somewhere else uh, later. So, so it's a it is selective, um, but that's just one component. Like I said earlier about what Bunker Labs is. So they have something called La- Launch Lab Online. Um, you can go. The best place to find out all the information really about Bunker Labs is bunkerlabs.org, the website, um, and all the information is there. The chapters, you know. You can, uh, get on their email list, follow them on social media, but really, you know, it's only going to get more, you know, have more presence across the, the U S um, in the near future as, as it expands. Cause it's really, if you look at it in itself, a nonprofit, a five-year-old nonprofit. So, so yeah, yeah that's uh, I, hopefully that answers the question, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's, you know, what I would say, especially on a podcast like this and for people that are interested to learn more, like it's not a, one-time thing like it's something i would try to plug in with everywhere you go not only maybe it's not something for you but maybe you know somebody else that it fits for so it's definitely um you know 
we we put a lot of work in the process to select the the people that that fit the best. And here's another thing I'll say, and, and as we talk to people, the vet, the veteran residence program isn't always about hey, you got you know you you already are established in this great business. That's part of it. But all, you know, probably same thing on the military side, like when you're putting a team together of people, you it's really not just about that individual. Yes, we want that individual to succeed, but how well do they work with other people? Because it's mm-hmm. a group, it's a group dynamic. That program's heavily, you know, based on that that um, you know, kind of mastermind ish type of an environment. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. So if we went to like simplify what Bunker Labs is, it's really like, like I mentioned, it, it's, it's, it's an organization that's helping veterans um, in, in the business world, right? Whether it's through mentoring, po- coaching, or even more formalized programs, but, um, and, and that's what the big thing. And, it, and, and so it's a nonprofit, right? Like you mentioned, um, how does that get, f- it's getting funded by some support somewhere, right? Absolutely. So that these folks can come participate. Okay. Yeah, and absolutely some pretty and and of course, like any nonprofit in the nonprofit space, there it's constantly evolving. Who they have had in the past, the sponsors might not be who is now, and and it will only increase in the future. But if they, we've been able to have pretty big backers so far. You know, like the Schultz Foundation, Starbucks, mm-hmm. uh, Chase Bank, yeah, yeah. Um, to name a few, or JP Chase Morgan. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, for our listeners, if you're interested in, you know, entrepreneurship, you're interested in business, like, you know, kind of transitioning into that business world, whether you've already separated, you know, a veteran or you're thinking about it later on, I, d- I highly recommend jumping on um, Bunker Labs, just at least to, to get on the website and, and check it out and see if it's for you and make some connections. That's a great thing you guys are doing. I really appreciate it, James. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And I will say, I mean, uh, just another way I would say it, like how I view it, and this is my mm-hmm. kind of interpretation, it's, I would say, a gateway to entrepreneurship, you know, mm-hmm. and not meaning, it doesn't mean if you're, you, you only come into it if you're in entrepreneurship or wanting to get into it. it no, it get, fits for all of it, but it's kind of that gateway organization, I believe, that does it really as good or better than any other organization right now out there on the military side that helps military, you know, veteran and military spouse get into business. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and to kind of transition real quick um, from the bunker labs to just your passion for entrepreneurship. I mean, you know, you also have an amazing podcast out there. I've listened to multiple episodes on there and you, and you've had some amazing people on there that have done so many uh, wild things like, you know, had side hustles throughout their entire career while they were in and, you know, set themselves up for success. So um, it's called Veterans and Business Show podcast, right? Could, could you like just uh, briefly tell us about what that podcast is about? And we'll make sure we add it to our show notes as well in case people want to take a visit. Oh, thank you for that. Absolutely. So basically, part of my story when I was coming out and, and kind of wrapping my head around even doing a podcast at all, I was like, okay, what's something I care about or would I, what would I want to do? So I, what I knew all along in my time in the military is, you know, even before I went in, I was going to be in business. You know, my grandpa, grandfather was an electrician, had an electrical company. They had a hotel in Lake Michigan. So I all along wanted to do business, but the business I was going to do when I got out, just it changed because of that that big vision that I had and the the that thing of just wanting to do something more than just be nothing wrong with being an electrician, but I don't I wanted to do impact more things than that. So as I was looking at different areas for podcasting, I was like, okay, I want you know, I was listening to a lot of podcasts and getting value out of uh, you know, different business ones I was listening to. So I was like, okay, I wanna really be able to learn and understand the business specifically niched down in the military and veteran side. So I came up, you know, kind of over time, the, the name and had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, the first, you know, like, like all of us, I think at the beginning, I had no training. Oh, yeah. So, it, you know, I kind of listened to some of, hopefully I'm getting better, but I listened to some of the early episodes and it's like, <laughs> just sounds rough. You know, you learn a lot of things about yourself, but, um, you know, it was just, you know, and I called it the Veterans and Business Show because I really want to do more than even done so far with it. It's just really talking about bu- things like Bunker Labs, talking about what's what's currently happening in the military and veteran business space. Just really kind of want to have a voice for for that and kind of use that podcast for that. So that's really how it started. Um, it's not the only podcast I do. I do one kind of about, actually, it's the second podcast I started. I started one that I still do related to a race called Ragnar Relay. So that was oh, kind of yeah. where I sort of cut my teeth a little bit. 
but over time, it's just interesting as I look back. I mean, for number one, like I had no idea in 2020, uh, Ragnar Relay still doesn't have their own podcast. So I have as close to as you get to the official podcast of Ragnar, <laughs> you know, and, and just, you know, fell into the race anyway while I was in the military. So, um, but, you know, it's helped me to be able to do a lot of different interviews. So not only have I done the ones on the military podcast side, but I've also done the, the Ragnar ones as well. So, kind of got me some more practice of being a podcaster. So, but yeah, the veterans and business show is just really want to talk you know, about people's stories. Like what has people learned in their business uh, journey so far and, and really just uh, dive into that. So that's, that's basically what the podcast is about. Man, that's awesome. And James, I, man, I, I really appreciate you coming on because I think that if, when people are listening to this, I don't even know uh, how many things they can pull from it. We talked about building relationships, getting out of your shell as you're transitioning. We talked about all the peripheral learning you have, you know, throughout your career, and maybe you should try to be more present in it. And, and you know, and, and also like just finding your place in the world. You talked about the Ragdoll Relay and you're like, there's no official podcast for this. So let's let's go ahead and talk about it. You know, and there's so many things out there like that where we can um, bring to bear our talents and our meaning and the purpose in life and get to enjoy, you know, uh, enjoy what we do. And I think that's so important. And um, you're a huge part and you're an inspiration to a lot of people. And I know that ever since I've got to know you, you know, in the short amount of time, um, I'm really appreciative of, of everything you're doing. And, and I've learned a lot from you too. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, Joe. And, and, uh, I also wanted to say like, like you had mentioned on the podcast, I've interviewed some people, like I knew people like this when I was in the military, didn't uh, pay as attention to it as, as I do now, where like, there's some people that are doing some amazing businesses and are doing the military at the same time. And I just, you know, now kind of looking back and, and thinking back and thinking how, knowing how hard business is, it just amazes me. Like I'm, I'm, I, yeah. each one of them, I was like, you know, hats off to you guys that you're able right. to, to really balance this. And, you know, certain people are able to just go right from their military time after they're done mm -hmm. into their business. So, uh, I mean, the, and it's just never been easier. I think now, now than ever to, yeah. to do things like that. So. Yeah. And I think people look at those. I, I know on my feed, I have a lot of military personnel and I, I'm pretty open. I like to connect with all of, uh, you know, down to the lowest airmen because I want them to see some, you know, some, some of stuff, you know, connect with them on that level. And, um, and I've seen some of them try out all these businesses and, and failure after failure after failure. But to me, there's so much character in that because they're still trying. Right. And like how many businesses do fail, but you know, uh, you could fail a hundred times, but maybe 101, right. Is the one that gets you over. And so I think that that's so cool. And then it's cool to have people like you that can help mentor and coach some people so that maybe we don't get to a hundred failures. Maybe you can, you know, help help shorten it down to 90, you know, before they figure something out through the experiences that you and the people that, you know, have. so Absolutely. that's amazing. Yeah. So, so, Hey brother, we usually like to wrap these up with what we call the leadership rapid fire, man. Um, uh, you know, for a series of four questions and, and it's just it, what your thought on the question is. Ready? Absolutely. All right, cool. So question number one, what is your favorite leadership trait? Servant leadership. All right. Awesome. Servant leadership. All right. Question number two, what is your favorite quote? You know, and I guess I already, I don't know if I'm cheating by saying it, said it earlier, I think, yeah. and I don't know if it's a quote, but like hearing the build the bridge before you need it, I think is the most fitting for what we've talked about. So I'll, I'll go with that. Awesome. Build a bridge before you need it. Or or right. actually, and I don't know if it's a quote, but I will say one more and, and you know, uh, no zero days. I've, I've been a part of a group that uh, uh, kind of high achievers and, and that was kind of the mantra, no zero days. And I like that of just each day moving the needle a little bit forward or just make, you know, doing something productive every day. So that, that'd be another one, I guess. So sweet. No zero days. I like that one. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Cool. So question number three, um, what would be your recommended book for an aspiring leader? And for you, let's, as we're talking about leadership, but we're also talking about entrepreneurship. So uh, we'll go ahead and, you know, either or like, what would be your number one book that you would recommend to either uh, an aspiring entrepreneur or aspiring leader? You know, one of the best books, and I have to say it, like I've read so many good books, but one that is just you know, so powerful. And he's a, a retired military guy as well. David Goggins wrote a book recently mm -hmm. called Can't Hurt Me. Yeah, I think that transcends all of it. I think it shows mm -hmm. it's got personal leadership. It's got leadership uh, mm -hmm. things in it. It's got business. You know, he, he's involved in, in different businesses stuff as well. So 
I think that's, that's a book I would definitely recommend. And I think, um, how to win fl- friends and influence people is a, is a good one as well. So I'll, awesome. I'll kind of say those two. Yeah. Well, I mean, and they're both written by two savages in, in their field. So that's awesome. Cool. All right. Final question. So in the Llama Lounge, we're all about life, learning and leadership. So how do you find your harmony between life, learning and leadership? That's that's a tough question. Just, I don't know. If, <laughs> yeah, and I and I don't know if I'm understanding it as well as I probably should. Like, because mm-hmm. I think I hear when I hear harmony, I think kind of sort of balance, and mm-hmm. that's tough because really I think it's a there's an ebb and flow, and you kind of are always trying to figure out what the right balance is of some of, of the things you know that you're mentioning. So I don't know that I have the right answer or I've figured it out necessarily. Like I think it goes to me to to talking about that slogan when I say no zero days, it's like every day reevaluating, you know, having benchmarks, you know, things that we have done in the military and learned in the military and continue to do in the military, you know, that the military does is, you know, it's like, okay, here's where we are. Here's what we could have done better. And then just kind of reevaluating, doing that constantly of, of self-improvement. So to me, I don't know if that answers that question, but that's like, I don't know that I know how to do it well, but you know, it's like just knowing what's important for you in your life and, and mapping those things out and, and then, you know, kind of course correcting as you go. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a phenomenal answer, man. And a lot of these questions we kind of throw out there and it's really to the interpretation of, you know, the member receiving it. And we've heard some great answers and that one's just as good as any of them. So appreciate that, man. So, so um, as we, as we wrap up, I definitely want to um, give you the opportunity to talk about, you know, how, how can someone reach you? Um, maybe they're interested in some of the stuff we talked about. Maybe they seek some coaching or mentorship um, and, and, and one more plug maybe for your podcast and, and any of the projects you might be working on. I'd love to kind of give you an opportunity to push some of those out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that opportunity. So people can definitely get a hold of me. Uh, I'm not hard to find. I'm on all social media platforms. Uh, if you search my name, James uh, Van Proyen. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. And and again, you can reach me on any of them. And, and I usually, you know, more, more times than not, accept everybody's, uh, you know, invite. And, and so far, I'm not at 5,000 on Facebook. So that's good. Um, but <laughs> Also, you know, have the the podcast network I'm, I'm a part of, or uh, militarypodcastnetwork.com is is a way to reach out and find out more. I got the Veterans in Business Show podcast, so that's on any podcast player out there. Would be honored for people to to not only listen but let me know, you know, how what you think and how we can make it better because we're always wanting to improve that. Um, also, in part, and something I want to promote is. Of course, mention bunkerlabs.org. That's the place to find out more about Bunker Labs. But we do. Podfest this year, we started something called Military Creator Con. And so that's really all about the creative space, not just podcasting, but whether it be YouTube, live video, just using what you're already doing and putting more voice to it um, through to kind of that new media, you know, with with content creation. So um, there's a Facebook group for that. So you can find us on Facebook at the, or just, you know, kind of search for Military Creator Con and, and welcome people into that group. Um, and that, that conference, you know, happens every single year. So, um, in 2021, it'll be back. Um, so it's, you know, that, that Facebook group is kind of an extension of the, of the conference as well. So PodFest and Military Creator Con. And then also I want to, um, I think that's it. Did I mention everything? I, th- I think I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And we'll add like the other, the Ragnar Relay in case anybody's interested in uh, listening to that one too. Cause I know, uh, my, some of my okay. ex troops. Yep. So some of my, uh, my, uh, ex, troops they they used to do that all over the world too so i'm sure they'd be interested in listening to that so but um awesome well th- man james um thank you so much for coming on um to the llama lounge and we really appreciate you and i and i like i said i really appreciate everything you're doing out there and it's really um created you know an optimism in me that there's amazing people out there you know doing great things um post military life um and i knew they were out there but uh but to kind of meet some, you know, it, it, it takes it to another level. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for that, Joe. I just uh, appreciate that there's, you know, people that are, that are getting the message out there on the podcast, you know, is dear to my heart and love what you got, you're doing as well. Get forward and I look forward to getting to know you better. And, you know, definitely, you know, if people, uh, please re- 
I'm sorry, I'm like losing my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Oh no, I was gonna say the so the uh, the Ragnar Life uh, podcast. There's a Facebook group mm-hmm. as well, so please reach mm-hmm. out to to connect on that side. But um, you know, my network is ever anybody else's network. So you know, if I can help anyone, that's what it's all about is is paying it forward. So um, I'm I'm here for anybody if they need any help. Awesome. Thanks, brother. And uh, once again, to all our listeners, um, thank you for tuning in once again. And um, as always, uh, uh, be safe, stay healthy, and llamas are out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Llama Lounge podcast. Be sure to visit the homepage for links to products and services related to this episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice. See you next time.